Ruth Roberts here. Hope you're doing well. It, uh, it's March. Actually, it's almost April. And uh, it's a rainy kind of day here in Charleston. Um, hope you all are doing well. I've got a couple of um, questions from folks that we're going to answer today. And one other thing that's come up. I've had several people email me a link that they saw uh, on Facebook or elsewhere about crockpots le leaching lead uh, out of them, as like many companies, whoever whoever owns the crock pot now, um, a lot of their stuff is manufactured in China, and as a result, um, they've got uh, you know so the folks are sending me this stuff, and um, even the Chinese are very dubious about what you know, what, th what they're getting presented with in their own country. Um, and so I thought, oh, all right, this is just a Facebook thing or an Internet thing, you know, this, the scare and the scam. But, and we, to be honest, we don't, because we have seven pets, we have four cats and three dogs, um, I don't normally use a crock pot because we'd have to make one almost every day. So what I do do is use uh, uh, some hotel pans because I happen to have a, commercial kitchen under my house but um, so I thought okay I'll go check check mine and see what's going on so I went to the uh, went to the pantry to get it out to take a look and I just want to show you what I found so this is my crock pot and that is pretty skanky looking so what you're seeing is the inside of it and um, those little lines that you're seeing is crazing, which, you know, is one of those deals that uh, happens with stuff that's uh, got a ceramic coating on it or a glaze, things of that nature. But I sure wouldn't expect all this crazy looking yellow stuff to be coming out. Um, so that's kind of weird. And I apologize for the uh, fingers and everything. I'm sorting, trying to sort things out. But let me just show you inside a little bit more. Um, and then outside, unfortunately, kind of the same deal. So pretty gnarly. Um, not something, not something I want to cook in. And I, I know that you guys don't want to cook in either. And hey, Leticia, good, good to see you. Leticia has been doing amazing stuff, putting together these gorgeous movies and, uh, just finding the most heartfelt stuff, um, explains extremely well what we're after and what you want, I, I think, for your, for your pets. Um, so thanks, thanks for all of that, Leticia, all the hard work you do. Um, but anyway, so back to that gnarly looking crock pot. Uh, that's fairly gross, and I don't think I want to cook in that anymore, so I'm going to be writing the company to find out, you know, what the heck's going on. Um, but in the short term, you know, if you go to your cupboard and you're finding some gnarly stuff there too, or if you have a relatively new crock pot, chances are good that it came from China. Our, all of mine broke last year, and so as a result, I'm having to, uh, you know, had to replace it because we do like to cook with it for ourselves. Um, but anyway, so the alternative for your pets is a cup, you know, a couple of things you can do. One is if you've got, especially if you've got a fair number of, of animals that you're feeding with a crock pet diet, get a roaster oven. And what this is is a tabletop oven that literally is meant to roast a turkey in. So they're typically around 18 quarts total, which means that you can do a triple batch of crock pet diet all at one go, uh, which is super because you're prepping once and then you can freeze it in say five day portions for your crew and uh, you know just bust that out every five days that way you're going to prevent any of the food from going bad so that uh, it's not a big issue other folks will use uh, baking casseroles and and just turn the oven down really low hey denise good to see you I, I think you're uh you're like the uh actually you're the last person that sent me this tip about the crock pet diet or excuse me, the crock pots being uh, contaminated potentially with lead. And um, so, and, and Gneese has been a long-term uh, crock pet user and maker for that matter. 
But um, so, you know, put it in a regular baking dish, bake it in the oven at 250 for seven to eight hours or till it's kind of all done and nice and loosey-goosey. Um, the, you can do it stove top. Uh, again, low, slow heat, probably, you know, three to four hours, something like that. And then uh, lastly, the other way folks are doing it is with a pressure cooker. Now, that's great because it does speed things up dramatically, but part of the traditional Chinese principle is to cook slowly with low heat so as not to add heat or energy, heat energy or fire to the food. So for South and Southeast, you know, if that's the way it's going to work for you best, go for it. If, um, if you can, do a slow cooker just because it's easier to uh, control the amount of heat energy that's going into the food. So one last shot of this kind of freaky looking crock pot um, with all the crazing and yellow freaky stuff kind of leaching out of the pottery. So uh, I'm, I'm contacting this company to find out what's going on. And um, Denise, thanks so much for that tip. Um, at any rate, you caused me to look a little bit deeper and then actually look in the cupboard and find this unattractive thing. So that's that's that. If you want more cooking tips, um, you know, just if, especially if you're already have purchased the original Crock Pet Diet ebook, um, we've got some in there. Use the Facebook community to ask questions and get get some things figured out. Um, we're here to help you in that in that uh, private Facebook community. Um, we had a a question from Dawn, who's and I hate this for you, Dawn. Her dog Apollo is two and a half years old, and um, what she asked about is that he has such severe kidney failure at this point that he is he's had to go to uh, teaching hospital at Cornell, and unfortunately have a transfusion. And what that means in terms of kidney failure is that the kidneys are so debilitated that they are unable to produce erythropoietin, which is a hormone that stimulates the bone marrow to produce red blood cells. And so without ongoing red blood cell production, you can't, uh, you can't make more red cells. And so the, you know, this person, this animal becomes profoundly anemic because they're no longer producing red cells. So it just stinks, and I apologize. I am still not smart enough to figure out how to uh, get your comments or questions that you may be uh, posting. Um, and so if I, if I don't cover something in this uh, talk, I will get to it at the end uh, and go back and post some answers to your questions if I haven't covered them for you. So she, you know, she messaged us on YouTube, on Facebook, on our website, and Don, I give you credit for digging deep and finding all the resources. Um, what can she do about her dog? Because it's just breaking her heart. And and I hate, really hate this for both you guys, because uh, it, it stinks. When d disease is that advanced at that young of an age, we're not going for cure. What we're going for is helping Apollo feel as well as he can possibly feel for as long as possible. Um, and I think, uh, Don, you're starting to work through our kidney uh, program. Um, so here's a couple of things you can, can think about. One is, if he is so, so sick that he is not eating, um, any big changes, supplements, things of that nature are not going to help because simply he's not going to want to take them down. So your first job is to get him eating. And this is where conventional medicine shines. It is great in an emergency situation, but as you probably got told, they got him stabilized, got him transfused, and then they probably told you that this doesn't look good and he's probably not going to be with us for much longer. So the first thing is get him stabilized. Um, he probably had a ton of intravenous fluids in the hospital. Subcutaneous fluids is something that most pet owners can do at home, whether they've got a dog or a cat. Um, so that's really important. Um, using medications to help control nausea and vomiting, like Serenia or uh, Reglan, something of that nature. And then acid reducers, like Pepsid, things of that nature, are helpful simply because it's going to help him feel better 
and hopefully if he's feeling better, he may start eating again. Another thing that's going to be important in the Western world is uh, some sort of a phosphate binder. If the animal's eating well, will you use uh, aluminum hydroxide? And if they're not eating well, uh, then often we'll use a prescription drug called Silevimar, which is used in humans to reduce uh, uh, the phosphorus content in the bloodstream. Phosphorus is what makes these guys feel bad. It tears their guts up um, to the point where they may vomit or have diarrhea. And so if we can drop that down significantly and get them feeling better, that just, you know, we can hopefully get them back to eating. Another thing you can try is um, appetite stimulants. Um, there's bunches of them. Actually, there's not bunches of them. There's ciproheptadine. B12 injections can be very helpful. And then um, golly, the other one that we usually use for cats, um, sorry, drawing a blank on the name, but I'll put it in the comments below for you. works well for dogs and cats. And, uh, you know, if we can get him happy enough to where he's eating, and uh, then we can start to incorporate some of these other ideas that, that I talk about in the kidney program. Quercetin is, if once they're eating, that is the bottom line. That is the next thing to add in because we've seen it help slow the destruction of kidney tissue down. Um, and the other thing that um, we, you know, again, if you can get him eating well again, that I've seen help dogs with chronic kidney failure and especially congenital disease is uh, stem cell therapy. It is not cheap. And, you know, if he's in a situation, when, when I was in practice, I had clients literally driving from Georgia, Alabama to come get a consultation about stem cell therapy. And the thing is, is that their pets were so sick. And really, it was a conversation at that point about what's best for this animal at this time. We're not going to get them better. Let's do what we can to help them feel as well as they possibly can. And then if the kidneys, you know, are just not responding to supportive care, then, you know, you have to really look at where that animal's quality of life is. And that is a terribly, terribly difficult decision to make. Uh, but this is where your responsibility as being the guardian and the spokesperson for your pet is really at play. You have to put your own feelings aside and decide what's going on with my animal. Is he suffering? Is he enjoying anything in life right now? And if the answer is yes, he is suffering and no, he's not enjoying anything, then it's time to make peace with that difficult burden and let your pet go to wherever it is we all go, and that's, that's the question nobody's reported back on yet, but let them go from suffering to peace. And golly, I hope, Don, that that is not where you guys end up, um, and I'm happy to help you in any way I can. But um, the first thing is get a meeting, and then let's try adding some other things in. Don, if you can find somebody that does acupuncture in your area, I think that's a great thing to incorporate because that can often improve appetite and feeling of, of wellness, so to speak, or at least relieve some of the malaise. So again, we have a chance to get this guy eating. The other thing I would do is do things that he loves to do. Uh, and so that may not be a six-mile hike right now, but that may be going to the beach that may be hanging out with some kids in the neighborhood he really loves. So kind of think about the things that he's enjoyed in life and try to do those things to the best that his energy level can handle. So my heart breaks for you, Don, but I hope that gets you some help. Um, if you're looking for, if you're up in Cornell, you're up in, you went to Cornell, you're up in the New York or um, that area of the, the country. So if you go to uh, ahvma.org, that's the American Holistic Veterinary Medical Association, it has a practitioner lookup to help you find somebody that may be able to do acupuncture or some other therapies that may help him feel better. And then the other uh, lookup, practitioner lookup, we often refer folks to is traditional ChineseVeterinaryMedicine.com or TCVM.com. That's the Qi Institute's 
uh, practitioner look up. So we'll definitely go there, find an acupuncturist. Let's see if we can get him feeling a little bit better. And again, I apologize for whatever reason I'm not smart enough to see comments in, um, in this thing. So I will... Um, So I will get uh, get them to you. And I finally pushed enough buttons to get this thing going. So, um, Helen, thank you so much for your, your comments, and I really appreciate it. So I can, I can finally see your comments, and again, happen to, happy to do whatever I can do to help you guys out. Um, so having said that, um, we get so many people that would purchase our kidney health program with their pets already in very advanced disease. And, um, and then they get into it and realize that this is not really going to be very helpful for my pet. It will be for uh, folks rolling forward. But um, what, what I've developed is something called a kidney health starter kit. And uh, it's, you know, it's something I put together a little bit ago and um, kind of sp expanded on it. So, um, what it does, the aim of that program is to explain to you in layman's terms what kidney failure is, what questions to ask your veterinarian, how to understand how severe or not severe the disease is using iris staging guidelines. And um, so it's kind of a, a starter, if you will, to, uh, to understanding where your pet is in this process. Um, what I and and it's you know we're we're just transitioning into some new awesome member membership sites. We've had some issues with ours and delivering the information products that you guys have purchased, um, but I've got a beautifully stable uh, platform now. So I've got the kidney health starter kit set up in there. It's pretty inexpensive. It's seven dollars. I think it's a good investment so that you know where your pet is and what's likely to be helpful or not helpful. There's also a comments section under there in the, uh, in the student area, and if you've got questions, I'm happy to answer them and let you know if that's something the, the kidney program will be helpful for you or not so much. Um, I want you guys to have the information you need in a useful format, and for that reason as well, please, please, please uh, email us at support at the original crockpetdiet.com message us leave us um, uh, comments on the uh, this page dr ruth roberts slash crockpet um, so we know what you need what we can do to change the product so that they're giving you the information that you need uh, we've got some exciting changes coming up but i want to make sure that we are covering the things that you need to have covered so that's kind of what I've got for right now. I'm just looking at my list to make sure I haven't missed anything. Again, I'm going to put that link down in the video here or down in the comments below the video. And, you know, please, please, please let us know what you need. Uh, we're, we want to make sure that we are serving you and your pets as best we can. Um, if you've got uh, topic ideas that you'd like us to discuss in blog posts, uh, things of that nature, let us know. Happy to, to get them answered for you. So that's what I've got on this rainy end of March day. And my hope is that this has served you. Um, and again, Dawn, I am so sorry about your, about your pup, Apollo. That just stinks. One of my old dogs had... One of my older dogs, Ollie, had congenital kidney failure, thankfully not as severe as Apollo, and we were able to make some really amazing changes for him back to the point where he got into normal values. And actually, Vicki is popping up a question. Um, she's got an 11-year-old schnauzer that hasn't held her bladder all night, and she's had a few accidents, and it doesn't seem to happen. I think if you take her out um, before bed... so. Vicki, there's a couple of things you can look at. One is make sure she doesn't have a urinary tract infection. Um, it's bizarre how many dogs walk in 
uh, or are brought in up, you know, they walk in thankfully, but mom and dad bring them in because all of a sudden this dog has started passing blood in the urine and lo and behold, there's a handful of bladder stones present. And it's stunning to me that they go for, you know, eight, 10 months or years with these stones with no symptoms and then all of a sudden they're there. So if this is a relatively new thing, I'd definitely make sure there's no urinary tract infection. If the urine is very dilute, ask your veterinarian to do a culture and sensitivity of the urine and make sure that there is not an occult infection present. And then also check kidney function. So if the kidneys are beginning to fail, but your, but your puppy is not showing any clinical signs yet as far as loss of appetite, vomiting, diarrhea, things of that nature, they're trying to compensate for the last lack of function by just drinking tons of water. And so in doing that, um, they may have some accidents at night. And then the other thing is, is if you strike out with both of those, um, urinary incontinence, so especially for females, female dogs, is a, is a big issue. Um, there are meds out there for that, some of which have undesirable side effects, um, but some of which work well for, for pets. So there is an um, estrogen compound called Incurin, which I'm not particularly excited about. I've not seen it work well. I actually saw one dog develop um, an autoimmune disease where her, the tissue on her nose got really kind of beat up. It's called bullous pemphigoid, which was not cool. The symptoms subsided after the incurin was stopped. Unfortunately, she, it never resolved completely. Um, but back to the incontinence issue, I think if you're going the medication route, um, the good old diethyl stilbestrol uh, at once a week dosing has worked extremely well. If you want to avoid going that route, there's a couple of things. One is um, feed the you know feed a cooked diet or at least a canned diet because the dry food causes these guys to have to suck up so much water to digest it that um, it just it can often make them have urine accidents. Uh, and then the other thing is too is that over time with the original crock pet diet, the uh, brassica vegetables, broccolis, things of that nature, help the liver function better so that it's helping to keep the hormones on a more even keel, if you will. That's been extremely helpful. Adrenal support is extremely helpful. So if you think about it, when we spay and neuter, um, we are putting female dogs into immediate menopause. Uh, some of them never actually became fully immune competent because we have been spaying and neuter very early to help control pet population issues, literally at sometimes eight weeks of age, um, and certainly well before that first heat cycle. So when we do that, the adrenal glands are now responsible for producing all of the sex hormones as well as the other hormones they're responsible for. And so by supporting adrenal function, by actually feeding uh, some adrenal gland and providing the pet's own organs, the raw materials they need to, to do their job, we can often improve that considerably as far as um, urinary incontinence. This will take time, but if it's not too awful a situation, I would definitely try that route first. We've used standard process products in the past, and um, you had to take multiple products to achieve the same effect. So for that reason, that's part of why I developed holistic total body support. Um, which is our multivitamin that includes glandular elements, so especially focused on liver and adrenal, um, but also the remainder of the endocrine system to help kind of rebalance it. So, Vicki, that's a great question. I hope this was helpful uh, and got, got some answers for you. Um, so if you guys, you know, and that, that is unfortunately a, a big problem. And it's not fun when your pets are either not getting you up in the middle of the night and you wake up to a giant puddle somewhere or the dog bed is soaked because your dog didn't realize she needed to go to the bathroom and didn't wake up. And what tends to happen in all of this is that the urethral sphincter relaxes and it already has too little tone if there is um, a hormone insufficiency, so to speak. So once that pet is sleeping, the sphincter relaxes more than urine just kind of pours out onto the dog bed, which really is not fun. And, and I find that 
many of these guys wake up uh, embarrassed because they're wet and they, they had an accident and didn't, didn't have any idea of it. So I hope this helps you guys. Um, please let us know what we can do to help you more. Um, again, this is a weekly feature, this, this uh, broadcast, and glad to answer any questions I can for you. Um, glad that was, that was a helpful uh, answer for you, Vicki, and she's already feeding a cooked diet, which is awesome. So she's going to go get make sure there's no physical reason like a urinary tract infection being present. And the one other thing I should add, just so it's in sort of in the back of your mind, um, is that we do see bladder cancer in dogs as well. Um, thankfully, it is very slow growing for the most part, and there's quite a number of things that we can do to kind of slow the progression of it down considerably. So go check that out, Vicki. You guys, thank you very much for coming today. Hope this was helpful, and uh, I hope the, that you enjoy the remainder of March and um, that all your pets are healthy and happy. Take good care. We'll talk soon. And I actually got through this without any pet photo bombs. Bye. Mm-hmm.